Hello, and you are listening to the Book Was Better podcast, the podcast where we talk about the book of the film. I'm Luke. I'm Courtney. And this week, we're talking about E.T., e. the extraterrestrial special edition. Wow. Hey, you. Put down the popcorn and turn on the light. Courtney Coulson in the house. Yeah, taking a break from finding a new detective to finding some extraterrestrials. Finding alien life here on Earth. Have you ever wondered what that would be like to just, you know, you're a small boy in a small town and then, holy crap, an alien comes in, completely changes your life around? Uh, who's to say there aren't aliens among us already, Luke? That's true. I have often looked at you and wondered... Lizard people in the government and our celebrity and yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, the first time I got you here, I lured you into the house with a trail of Reese's Pieces. <laughs> oh, there's going to be a lot of product placement in this book. I would say so. And this is a really special uh, one because it is the special edition. Now, um, what is so special about it? Well, mm, well that's <laughs> very debatable. But E.T. has an interesting past because um, there's the extraterrestrial novel by William Kotzwinkel. Uh, sounds like a real name, right? I'm looking at it on the shelf there. See, it's that one. Uh, Kotzwinkel? Yeah. I can't read it from here. Anyway, I've seen that on lists as one of the best novelizations ever. And he also wrote a follow-up book, uh, Green Planet or something like that, which I had as a kid and it was boring as all shit. But um, after Lucas had done his Star Wars re-releases and added stuff with CGI, Spielberg decided, Christ, that's a good idea. That's really fantastic. And in 2002, he released a special edition of E.T. It doesn't surprise me that Lucas was the first one to do special editions. Yeah. And um, Spielberg, at least, has come out and pretty much said he regrets doing it now. And there was a lot of controversy about things like he replaced the guns with walkie-talkies. It's something that's been parodied a lot. Yeah, I think the only one that I... The only special edition that I think actually benefited from that is... uh, Oh, actually, two Ridley Scott films... Legend and Blade Runner, both of them were edited to all hell for the cinema release, but on the DVD you get so much more. In the case of E.T., it's fine the way it is. Don't do anything. Well, the E.T. puppet's really great. I mean, it's a wonderful creation. It's kind of freaky. It's a little bit scary, and I feel like they tried to make E.T. a little bit more friendly, and they CGI'd a lot of his facial expressions, and there's a couple of scenes where he's completely CGI. There's a new scene that happens in the bathroom. Anyway, when, when this film came out, I don't know, you might be too young to remember this, but there was a big E.T. push for the special edition. Like, there were toys in Toys R Us, there were figures and things well, like no, that. Well, no, because this was 2002, so I was right at the, the age where they were marketing these things to me. Yeah. So I do remember having the E.T. doll and stuff, and he's fascinating. He's both disgusting and adorable. <laughs> at the same time, yeah. yeah. Like a lot of people I know, actually. And, um, yeah, so... At the same time, they did a junior novelization to coincide with this release. And that's the one we're going to do today. Uh, I would like to do the Cotswinkle at some stage, but it's a little thick. Yeah. But this junior novelization is perfect for um, my junior co-host, Courtney Carlson here. Something you can lift, I don't know. Oh, actually, <laughs> I, that's a terrible thing to say because you've got far bigger muscles than I do. That's true. Uh, sadly, this is just a podcast, but I would show them off to you guys if I could. <laughs> them guns, son. Welcome to the gun show. So let's get into this. I'm pretty excited about E.T. It's written by Howard Mason. Now, he's the author of other novelizations such as... Now, he's done some interesting ones here. Um, Legend, Weird Science... And Baby Secret of the Lost Legend. Now, the last one I didn't know, we, we just watched a trailer for it, and it's a baby dinosaur. A, uh, is it 
uh, oh. Diplodocus? It's a Brontosaurus, which doesn't actually exist. Is that the one that... Yeah, so the Brontosaurus is not real. The Brachiosaurus is right. Yeah. Well, this was before they knew that. This was like 1985. Yes. And I remember watching it on video, and I'm pretty sure that although the trailer, the 30-second trailer, is filled with shots of dinosaurs, I'm pretty sure that movie is light oh, on the yeah. dinosaur front. Uh, but that was the pace of these kinds of things. I was actually pleasantly surprised re-watching this to realise that E.T. actually fully appears in this and you get to see him unveiled about probably 15, 20 minutes in. Whereas um, I feel like a lot of those earlier films, you waited like three quarters of the film before you saw whatever creature or... Alien, Predator. Yeah. Although in Alien's case, uh, or even in Predator's case, I think they, they've managed to make that work for the plot. So let's start with the beginning. We'll, we'll take turns with paragraphs here. Yeah. It'll be a bit easier. High above the sleepy lights of the unsuspecting suburbs, planted firmly in a clearing amid the thick, unyielding forest, sat a shiny, spherical vehicle, out of place and not of this earth. Curling with mist, its round underbelly emitted a golden glow from a single open hatch, a suggestion that whatever odd inhabitants had once dwelled inside, those who had travelled so very far from home, had already made their way onto our earth and were going about their business. And business it was, the half-dozen stunted, wrinkled, gnome-like creatures who shuffled in the shadows, rustled the foliage, had a very clear-cut mission. Their elongated fingers delic delicately plucked samples from the shrubs and trees, waddling their treasures safely back to the confines of the ship. The interior was already filled with exotic plants and phosphorescent mushrooms, specimens from all over the galaxy, kept alive and vibrant by a fine spray of life-giving water. The visitors were botanists, but more than that, there were aliens. Extraterrestrials was the fancy way of putting it, or E.T., as the people of Earth often called them, as it was easier to say. Setting the bar low. <laughs> this particular group was undertaking a covert mission with a high degree of risk, although if any of them feared discovery, then they very rarely showed it. Each task was carried out with a practiced, calm efficiency. Only when an owl surprised them with an unruly hoot did they all pause from their mission, the red heart lights in their chests illuminating in unison until they were sh assured that they were safe. The spacemen worked as a team, connected in both mind and body, but one among them seemed more curious than the others. Hoping to outshine his peers, this particular E.T. delves further from the ship than was normally allowed. He'd find the best specimens, he'd pull out the rarest roots, he'd... <clears throat> His drive to succeed was leading him to the very edges of the forest where he was both surprised and perplexed to find himself gazing down at the vast grid of city lights below. Humans, he thought. He would never understand them. Keep your distance, E.T., his father had said. They're savages, all of them. But what E.T. didn't know was that soon the humans would be coming for him. All right, so this is why I like this book. This is already starting to get into E.T.'s head. Yeah, it's totally from his perspective. And, like, his family's head? <laughs> You don't even think about his family. I guess he does have a family. That's but come from somewhere. Yeah, this Unless idea... Unless they're plant creatures. Yeah, this idea that they know about humans and are sort of wary of them and there's a history there, that's really interesting. But, I mean, remember in Gremlins there was all that backstory in the book about them being aliens from another planet and all this <laughs> sort of stuff. I didn't know that. It's, yeah, it's the novelizationist... Um, yeah, it's one of those things where, do we really need that backstory? I think it's cool, though, to do it in a junior novel. Yeah. Um, they don't normally go to that extent, but uh, yeah, it's weird. I, I already start to feel, and this is going to come up a bit more, that E.T.'s a little bit judgmental. Yeah, or the author is. Yeah, which is weird, because, uh, I don't know, I find E.T. very friendly in the film. Yeah, um, I guess that's the thing with silent characters, you can just project whatever you want onto them. But sure enough, these faceless humans do show up, and they do act quite savagely. They've got their noisy cars, their probing flashlights. Uh, all the other aliens retreat to the ship, but E.T. gets separated. Um, and in the special edition, the CGI E.T. like jumps around like a maniac. Really? Yeah, like you see him sort of leaping through the forest to get away from them. Um, That's and what those the, long arms are for. Yeah, and the book makes sure to really drive that point across here. 
The red light in his chest screamed danger, a beacon summoning him back to the ship, but also broadcasting his location to the entire forest. Shrieking a string of alien curses, E.T. weaved and vaulted through the undergrowth with surprising speed. His body was squat and his legs near non-existent, and yet he managed to propel himself forward like a juiced-up jackrabbit. He had been quite the accomplished athlete in his youth, and back on his planet, his house was filled with many trophies. What? And it reminds me of Howard the Duck, like just picturing, um, you know, like this... Strangely suburban uh, mundane Yeah, stuff. but everything in it is like an E.T. version. Like he's got um, a little E.T. pole vaulting or something on a, on a trophy, on a statuette. E.T. movie posters of other movies that we have here on Earth. There's a little bit of Peter David kind of snark here as well. Like yeah. he doesn't have legs. Mm. Why have him jumping? His feet are attached to his ass. <laughs> Uh, my hero, Peter David. Yeah. But of course, as we know, he doesn't make it back to the ship, and the spaceship leaves without him. E.T. couldn't believe these saucer-like eyes. They'd left without him, all alone, a million light years away from home. Oh, that mum has left me behind before, I can tell you. Oh, it's traumatic. It's traumatic. Uh, his wife, his family, now here he was, marooned among the human animals. Unbelievable, thought E.T. bitterly. If I ever make it back, then rest assured, my supervisor is going to hear about this. The lone spaceman began to waddle towards the streetlights, determined to make things work. <laughs> That's such an odd detail, but then at the same time, I think these guys... You know, they are here. They're on a job. They must have some sort of structure. And they did not do their due diligence. You know, what happened to no spaceman left behind? There's this almost British, uh, like, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sensibility about this. It, it, it is weird. I think they were really intent on making E.T. more personable and relatable like you know how Spielberg was involved with DreamWorks and they were doing all that animation and having all the success with those really contemporary references and everything was like being a bit hipper and cooler you look at like Shrek and all that sort of stuff as well I just feel like this book was trying to change our perception from you know E.T. Yeah. as this relic of the past and kind of get it just what a little bit... What are kids bit... in 2002? Yeah, yeah. Complaining and... about managerial systems. Yeah, again, making him more of a maybe, like, relatable character. Hard to say. Anyway, we go to the humans in the suburbs, and here's some more editorialising from Howard Mason. Oh, this is great. Mary's kids were out of control. With a long-absent husband, she'd become a single mother with a soft touch, and everybody knew it. That's why Mike, her oldest son would often use their rundown house as a den for late-night Dungeons & Dragons sessions with his raucous pals, while her younger boy, the often neglected Elliot, whined endlessly to participate. Now, here they all were, smoking cigarettes inside, ordering endless pizza and swilling tab cola like diabetes was a thing that only happened to other people. They were like the naughty boys on Pinocchio's Pleasure Island, begging for someone more responsible to come along and turn them into donkeys. We we're just talking about trying to get this more modern. Uh, I think Howard Mason's views on uh, women and their, their role in the home are uh, a little outdated. Yeah. Very judgmental about Mary, but at the same time, you, you know, your parents don't let you all smoke and eat pizza and uh, curse and yeah. in the house. Well, Mine wouldn't either. Well, I'm swearing. Well, there's, there's some swear words I'm not allowed to say, but then Dylan's allowed to say them, and I think that is unfair. What Do you want to list... What are your three favourite ones you're not allowed to well, say? Well, my favourite one is the C word, yeah. and I'm not allowed to say the C word. You're allowed to say it here. This no. is my house. My rules. No, because Tim the Stats Man will put it on my... Oh, put it on your permanent record. Yeah, it goes on my permanent <laughs> He'll tick that little box. No. All right. Oh, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna peer pressure you into doing that. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody should be peer pressured into Dungeons and Dragons. We know it's a, it's a satanic game. Yes. <laughs> uh, cigarettes. That's just a whole mess of trouble. Clearly, D and D was uh, invented by Alistair Crowley. He, yes. Yes. <laughs> Very famously uh, invented by Alistair Crowley. If you check out his uh, Wikipedia page. <laughs> And, um, yeah, goddamn Mary, here she is. Uh, this is Elliot's mother. She is the one that is letting all of this go on. 
<clears throat> Tightly wrapped in a pink silk robe, Mary looked pretty good for an old woman. She had a fine figure, Mary knew it too. Bent over the dishwasher, she couldn't help but bop and boogie and jiggle her butt. <laughs> Not saying that ever again. A, de <laughs> a detail that wasn't lost on the wily Greg, who leant across and prodded it with a finger. Stop it, barked Mary, for the truth be told, she loved the attention. It would been a while since she'd been touched. Whoa. I guess any port in a storm, huh, Mary? Great. Scotch. And Elliot has to go and meet the pizza man at the bottom of the driveway. I don't understand why he doesn't, like, just come to the frigging door. It's like, is that what happened in the 80s? Was there a gate in front of it? And then this poor pizza, like, this pizza goes on a journey which is longer than the one ring like mm -hmm. elliot takes it on a tour to the back of the house he goes into the garden going to rivendell yeah he's looking for the dog harvey he has an adventure with some trolls he meets Gollum. he hears a noise in the shed and then he does this incredibly dumb thing for a moment he considered using the pizza as a shield yet El elliot doubted the protective powers of pepperoni what? Instead, he placed it gingerly in the middle of the lawn. If a wild animal attacked, then perhaps it would go for the pizza instead of him. <laughs> Not a bad plan. But yeah, uh, kind of odd. This pizza is doomed. And of course, Elliot does get freaked out and he steps on the pizza. And damage to the pizza... <gasps> That really gets red-blooded American Mike. Oh, good Gets Lord. him springing into action. You stay here, Mom. We'll check it out, sang Mike in a booming voice. Murder murderously brandishing a kitchen knife, he led the others outside to confront the intruder. Just what I need, thought Mary. Another man in my life who's going to end up in prison. Yeah, like we're getting these sort of hints at what happened with their father, and it seems pretty dark to me. There's so many backstories. I know. And um, look, here's a fine example of the American education system. Mike examined the strange three-toed footprints in the dirt. Coyotes come back again, Mom, he deduced grimly. A three-toed coyote, thought Elliot. Sure, Mike was brave, but he'd skipped a lot of school. I never got that in the film. You see the prints. They're like weird, amphibious, three-finger thing. And he's like... Coyote's back. No, Mike. Have you seen a coyote? Like, even if your only knowledge of coyotes was watching Roadrunner cartoons, you would still not think that this was a coyote. <laughs> uh, and I thought this was kind of odd, a little bit daring for a junior novelization. Mary gave Steve a playful swat across the head. No douchebag, talk in my house. The last thing she wanted to be reminded of was her husband. Um, yeah, she's got some unresolved issues. Okay. Yeah. And look, their antics did not go unseen. E.T. wrapped his long fingers around the door, watching the herd of human animals stomp back into the house. Brash, uncivilized, aggressive, loud-mouthed, voices that made his saggy skin crawl. It was everything he'd feared and a whole lot worse. Welcome to America, E.T. Yeah, as I said, British sensibility about this. Hmm. He's a bit more refined than these characters, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but look, Elliot... He cannot let it go. He's convinced he's seen something. So he sneaks out later that night and starts looking through the bushes. And this is where he first encounters the terrifying E.T. And I was disappointed at this because I don't know if you remember in the original film when you see the puppet and he sees Elliot for the first time and screams, it's truly frightening image. It's terrifying. But now they've replaced it with a, a far friendlier, cartoony looking CGI Elliot, um, E.T., yeah, I can't remember. Uh, I think I've seen both versions. Now now they're bleeding into one. I don't know what... There, there are some sites which have screenshots of them both, and definitely you'll be horrified when you see it, because it's that early CG as well, where it just... It's not great. It's really chalky texture. It's like um, the first version of the CGI Jabber. It's just awful. E.T. squealed in revulsion, unsure if the smaller human was going to stab him, stab at him, or try to eat him. Elliot screamed in return. The creature was squat, naked, brown, wrinkled with a long neck, large watery eyes, and a squashed-in face. With a disgusted shudder, he was reminded of the time he accidentally walked in on his grandfather in the shower. Whoa! Well, was that bald and smooth? Yeah, um, I can kind of see it, though. I mean, that's not a bad metaphor when you think about it. Like, E.T. does kind of look like a old man that's lost his way. Yes. And his ears, to be fair, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember as a kid, I would think about, you know, would 
aliens be automatically scary looking to us? Um, because, I mean, there's a lot of species on this planet that we find cute. And there's ones that we find scary. So, it, do we have like a 50-50 shot of en encountering a cute or terrifying creature? Depends on your life experience. Obviously, Elliot had had an experience that made this a little bit yes. frightening. The next day, um, Elliot has a plan to lure the creature back, scattering delicious Reese's pieces Pretty throughout hard. the forest. Back at uh, dinner, though, his family just do not believe him about the goblin, is what they're calling it. And we also meet baby Drew Barrymore for the first time, who is absolutely <laughs> stuffing her face with meat. What are you going as, Gert? asked Mary, desperate to shift the conversation away from Elliot. Gertie stabbed a large piece of beef with a fork and pushed it into a massive mouth in a tiny face. <laughs> Mike was amazed she could even lift it. I'm going as a cowgirl, she mumbled through the dripping mass of meat. Does she mean that like in the sense that she is eating an entire cow? <laughs> it's crazy. You look at that in the film. Huge, huge hunk of meat. And she's just gnawing at it like a dog. Gotta say, though, I still absolutely love this dialogue. Maybe it was a pervert or a deformed kid or something, snickered Mike with malice. Both had caused big problems in their community over the last few years. Weird. <laughs> a deformed kid parroted Gertie uh, gleefully from beneath a slick sheen of gravy. Maybe an elf, Mike continued, or a leprechaun, he added with a cheeky Irish lilt. The broad racial stereotyping was the final straw for Elliot. Standing up at the table, his own face pinched in an impish scowl, he bellowed, It was nothing like that penis breath. <laughs> Elliot, Mary scolded, forcing back a chuckle as the well-placed uh, jibe. Sit down, Gertie giggled into her beef. Penis breath. It is still in there. I love the fact that in the 80s, a kid could call another kid penis breath. Because that had some connotation. In a family film. And no wonder Mary scolds him. It's probably been quite a while since she's had penis breath. She's probably feeling a little bit nostalgic, thinking that she might need a conjugal visit at the jail at some point in the future. So, shunned by his family, Elliot camps outside... And who should he see coming out of the shed? Can you guess? Oh, I don't know. John Waters? Free Willy? Snagglepuss? No, it's E.T. E.T.'s three stomachs had been growling in the forest until the child had left his bounty, and now he craved the deliciously unmistakable creamy Reese's peanut butter taste in a crunchy candy shell. Reese's Pieces, just so you know, is bold and in italics in the book. Yes, and I, does it have little trademark? Yeah, probably. The treats had an almost narcotic effect on his alien physiology, and now he craved them. Against his better judgment, he tottered along the chocolate trail, even though the human child sat directly in his path. Desperate times call for desperate actions, thought E.T. defiantly, although it completely went against his character. Deep in his glowing heart, he was a creature of comfort. He loved good food, and he hated camping. His brain said stop, but his stomach screamed, MORE! <laughs> He's on a candy high. God, this makes me want to eat delicious, uh, creamy peanut butter taste in a, a crunchy candy shell. Wow. So... Calm down, Luke. <laughs> Elliot... I oh, know, my pupils just dilated. Elliot lures E.T. into the house and into his bedroom, and they try to communicate... Well, I'm here now, thought E.T., and who knows, maybe this kid has a way of getting me home. He'd need an electronic, some sort of transmitter. It was time to make contact. Elliot nervously scratched his nose. Was that some sort of earth greeting? E.T. begrudgingly ran a finger along his own. Bewildered, Elliot pressed his fingers to his mouth. E.T. followed suit in hopes that an explanation might follow. Wow, exclaimed Elliot. The boy stuck a finger in his ear. Elliot sighed. E.T. E sighed. E.T. sighed. Uh, this was going to take a very long time. It must be very frustrating to be in a strange place and have to learn a new language. I have no idea what that's like. The next day, Elliot, prankster, fakes being sick so that he can stay at home with his new friend, and he starts telling him about all the things in his room. Elliot waved around the plastic monsters. This is Greedo, he explained, and this is Hammerhead. Looks like my wife, E.T. thought with a smirk. Finding out a lot about this wife. I'm really curious about this woman. <sighs> wife jokes, really? Yeah. Uh, at least he doesn't do any, like, take my wife, please kind of stuff. <laughs> 
But it's weird, it's E.T. and Elliot. And I just realised the connection, the name is sort of, if you abbreviate, this is going to confuse me for now. And this all goes on for some time. It gets even more confusing. This is a peanut, said Elliot. You eat it, but you can't eat this one. This one is fake. E.T. prided himself on the fact that he was fluent in three different languages, but this kid was moving way too fast. This is money, see, continued Elliot. You put the money in the peanut. E.T. did know all about botany, though. Recalling his knowledge of peanuts and peanut-like plants, he knew that something was clearly amiss with this kid. Great, he thought. Of all the kids in the world to go to for help, I have to pick the one with special needs. Now, that is judgmental of E.T. Yeah, and it's... Well, this is 2002? I know. Do that? Casting dispersions. Casting aspersions, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Not cool at all. I didn't know E.T. was like that. We're learning a lot about E.T. E.T. is a penis breath. He's a bit of a dick. Dick move, E.T. Anyway, E.T. gets Elliot to go to the kitchen and then decides to steal everything (laughs) that he can and just get out of here because... E.T. species, which never has a, gets a name. No, it doesn't. No. Uh, mostly kept themselves. It kept their mental bond strong, a gift unique to the gentle space gnomes. The problem with... Uh, being around strangers was that sometimes, without even realising, the two of you could wind up with an unwitting psychic connection. Best to move on and do the solo. Not realising its function, E.T. pulled a black umbrella from a pile of Elliot's belongings, assuming its metals might be useful when uh, <clears throat> when crafting his device. Suddenly, it snapped open in his hand, causing E.T. to squeal in shock. But he squealed even louder when he heard Elliot's echoing shriek from the kitchen as he dropped a carton of milk. The link had formed already. Are you kidding me, groaned E.T., a whole planet at my disposal, and I bonded with the shaved monkey. The dog was a better option. The space botanist union was going to have to hear about this. This is a unique take, because I thought they actually got along pretty well in the film. They were best buds, right? No, but the thing is, you watch it again, you can see this resentment boiling. Oh. I wonder if because I saw it as a kid in the 80s, like I was only about six or seven, mm. I just didn't pick up on any of this subtext. Yeah. Um, I've not watched it recently, so... Yeah, no, it's there, I'm which is the interesting thing. Yeah. Um, and as I said, this is a special edition, so it has the extra scene in the bathroom where Elliot, first he weighs E.T. and tells him he's fat, <laughs> and then... Look how tall you are, mused Elliot, watching their reflection. I'm 4'6". You must be around... Distressed and depressed, E.T. defiantly elongated his neck. It had at least another foot to his height. This dumb kid was not going to humiliate him again. See, I didn't know E.T. was so petty and insecure about these things. I guess you don't. Like, he's an adult. He's a botanist. He's got a wife. He's got trophies. He doesn't want some kid treating him like he's an idiot. That would be so frustrating. Yeah, and as a short person myself, I know that it's humiliating when there are children towering over you. Exactly. So I'm actually becoming on side with this. Yeah. Yeah. I I like E.T. more now than I ever have before. Yeah, I get this. Elliot tells him all about the pipes and that the dead bugs come through the pipes, and then Elliot's mum phones. So while he tries to convince her that he's sick, E.T. just climbs into the bath. The melancholy alien fully immersed himself in the warm water of the tub, a welcome slither of tranquility that reminded him of his aquatic home. The soothing liquid dulled the prattle of the insane kid as E.T. desperately attempted to isolate his thoughts. You can survive this. You just need a plan. Think, goddammit! Finally noticing the prune-like beast staring from beneath the water, Elliot Elliot rushed to E.T.'s side, straining to lift the creature to the surface. You could drown in stuff like this, Elliot gasped. The laconic E.T. pushed him away and descended back beneath the water. He blew a recalcitrant bubble. Is this your idea of a good time? asked Elliot cluelessly. You have no fucking idea, kid, thought E.T. sadly. That I didn't expect. I swear! In a junior novelization. That's kind of crazy. But then again, this was a different time. If you're going to have douchebag talk, penis breath... I mean, look at that Terminator book we did, which was just filled with all these really explicit sex scenes. It was just, it's just different from what we're used to now. Everything's just sanitized. I guess so. I think it's good because it intensifies the emotions. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Mike comes home and finally sees E.T. with his own eyes, followed quickly by Gertie. Mike's jaw dropped, his brow furrowed, his nose wrinkled, the thing 
was like a raisin with eyes, the love child of a deformed kid and a pervert. It reminded him of that time he walked in on his grandfather in the shower. Apparently they all did this. Yeah, like once is an accident, (laughs) twice I'm not so sure. Granddad, what you been doing? (laughs) E.T. huffed. You ain't no old painting yourself, he thought. Uh, kid had a face like an ape having a wank. <laughs> Good lord! We must have the British version. I you know s- how they change some words for I, the British version? I think so. Yeah. Ape having a wank. That's more of a British thing than an American thing. Yeah. Weird. And then in... <clears throat> and then in swept Hurricane Gertie, all blonde hair and big mouth. <laughs> Elliot, look what I made for you, she bellowed, waving around a dog-eared piece of paper covered with indecipherable scrawlings of the young. Her wild eyes settled on E.T. and her huge maw twisted into a vortex of screams. (laughs) Assaulted by the stench of meat and death, E.T. shrieked helplessly at the nightmare world he had been forced to become a part of. Yeah, this captures it for me. Now I'm locked in. Like, that's intense. And that's what it feels like watching this film. It's alienating. I know, it's so crazy. And then Elliot decides he's keeping E.T. and makes Gertie promise not to tell Mum by letting Mike torture her doll. Twisting the defenceless doll's fabric arm, Mike sneered with silent menace. Take that, you dirty little doll, he thought. This is only the beginning. From his nest of plush toys, E.T. watched in abject terror. Savages, he thought. If we weren't such a peaceful race, we would obliterate them all. (laughs) He's not getting a very good showing. These humans aren't very good guests, to be fair. Yeah. Or very good hosts, I should say. Yeah. A ter- like, a child's doll is just twisting it around. That's really harsh. I thought this is weird as well. Mary, like we said, there's some issues here. Mary roamed the house, watering plants that didn't need to be watered. She wore her absent husband's shirt and no pants. She was an overflowing cauldron of passion and emotion. Maybe she should order a pizza. Pizza guys were young and horny, right? Maybe she should invite Mike's friend over. Uh, yeah, she's, Mary's gonna get herself into trouble. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think someone needs to call child services or something. Maybe look at the custody here because uh, that's worrying there. Something needs to be looked at. Now, the kids get to hang out for a while with their strange visitor. Mike still trying to figure out what it was. Could be a monkey or an orangutan, reason Mike, the master of reason, Mike. <laughs> he, you can fucking talk, thought E.T. Wow, E.T.'s harsh. <laughs> he's got a point, though. Like, who's Mike to call him a... Clearly, he's not... I mean, I guess Mike thinks coyotes are amphibious with three toes, but... It's a coyote tang. Yeah. Um, but I have to say that when you see, like, a sun bear with mange or something, they do look like other creatures yeah. together. Yeah, I guess he's just trying to, you know, get to the bottom of this without raising alarm too quickly. It was a very odd situation for everyone. Anyway, Elliot... He can't pretend to be sick forever. He goes to school and he deals with the bullies at the bus stop. Where's he from, snarled Ty? Uranus? He waited for this to sink in, but Elliot stared at him blankly. You get it? Your anus? Explained Ty, saying it slower. He was suggesting that Elliot's supposed goblin had somehow managed to emerge from his actual anus. His butthole. His asshole. It was a play on words, like it was some kind of shit goblin that he had shat out from his shithole. He doesn't get it, Ty, sighed Steve, turning towards the school bus. Not sure I get that one either. Maybe that's like a generational thing. I don't know. I don't know. Uranus, the. Uranus. God of the sea. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand that. So, um, while Elliot is at school, E.T. gets a mad hankering for some beer. (laughs) In lieu of the unmistakable creamy Reese's Pieces peanut butter trademark, taste in a crunchy candy shell, E.T. raided the refrigerator, desperate for anything that might give him a buzz, like perhaps a crisp, icy core, the, uh, which is in capitals, by the way, the world's most refreshing beer. Interesting. A product placement running rampant. But I, I could do with the cause right now as well. And um, at school, because E.T. got drunk, remember they were bonded, Elliot is drunk. I forgot about this. Yeah, this is the best scene. Elliot blinked heavily. 
I'm fucking buzz, son! He grinned to himself. He turned creepily towards his classmate, the young Erica Aleniak. She was hot enough to be on Baywatch, a show that hadn't been invented yet, but it was only a matter of time. What? I'm gonna get up to my nuts in your guts, said Elliot's glassy eyes. What? I guess that's the the thing. When you do a special edition and you're writing with hindsight, you can reference things that don't exist yet. Did anyone check this before they published it? No, I mean, that's what he's thinking. Everyone's had childhood crushes. <laughs> Dear Lord. Yeah, I think that's fine. And then... Frogs were fucking everywhere. Seriously, there were so many fucking frogs that the teacher didn't know what the fuck to think. Kids were covered with frogs, kids were fucking screaming. Elliot was just grabbing girls and fucking kissing them on the mouth like he didn't give a shit. See, I think what Howard Mason has done here is really captured just that recklessness of what it's like. It does, You know, when you're drunk. Especially if your kids act like they're drunk anyway. (laughs) They are basically drunk. Let's be honest. So then intensify that. Add a couple of cause lights. Madness. Oh, yeah, and it's just crazy. And then, this E.T.'s drunk. E.T. was drunk as fuck. He walked into walls while that monster Gertie watched Sesame Street and shit. E.T. was right fucking there in front of Mary, but she must have been blind or stupid or some shit because she didn't even notice the wrinkled print face spaceman wearing a flannelette shirt that was destroying her living room. The irresponsible Mary was the perfect example why every household needed a man. <laughs> So, <laughs> I was fine with it up until that point. Too far. Yeah. Howard Mason. Maybe, Has an agenda. Maybe, yeah, a gender agenda. A gender agenda, yeah. Maybe he's had some uh, women problems in his life. I wouldn't be surprised. I imagine being a novelizationist is a lonely... Anyone um, who would write something like this must have something a little wrong with them, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Okay, Gertie, E.T. still drunk, remember, puts E.T. in drag and teaches him how to talk. E.T. felt luscious in a long dress, blonde wig, and fashionable hat. I have a feeling that uh, Howard Mason has done this before. Uh, yeah, probably. He felt like a man killer, king queen, king slash queen of the world. He felt hot, drunk, sexy, and unstoppable. Gertie had taught him to talk. Perhaps he mused she was the smartest one here. Because, despite her age, she had at least taught him the basic phrases to make things work. Phone home. A.T. Elliot. He was wearing a bra and he never felt more beautiful. You go, E.T. I like that. I think that's great. He's discovering a lot about himself. And this is the other thing. E.T. was particularly enamoured with the hair. If he ever made it home, he would start up a wig shop and cover every wrinkled dome with an alluring mane. Space locks, he would call it. He got shivers just thinking about running his long fingers through those delicate tresses. Um, that reminds me of the platypus in Blinky Bill. Uh, was it smooth, bald head, brown head? Uh, yeah. He's going to take those smooth brown heads and he's going to turn them into <laughs> just beautiful locks. manes. I love it. And then E.T. shows off a new power. And now... This is interesting. A circular saw served no purpose in an interstellar transmitter, and yet E.T. had maliciously included one in the hope that the idiot Elliot might injure himself. Now that his wishes had become reality and red blood flowed from the monkey child's finger, E.T. felt an unfamiliar pang of guilt. No worry, he still had one more power up his sleeve. The alien's index finger glowed with a healing light. Touching Elliot's wound, it both soothed the pain and erased the abrasion. The last time one of E.T.'s kind had used this power on Earth, he had been nailed to a cross and kick-started an international holiday. What? That's fitting as we go into this Easter season. Starbuck. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Three days later, though, you know, well, it took his time. What would that cross look like? Really long arms and no legs. Probably pretty much the same. <laughs> Interesting. Maybe the legs stretch out like the, the neck does. That might be how he jumps. Like Ram Man. So it's Halloween. Here's another special edition change. Originally, Mary, and this happens off screen, yells at Mike that he is not going as a terrorist. Now, instead, it is, is changed to you are not going as Barack Hussein Obama Care Obama. That was really weird. That wouldn't have even made sense in 2002. What? Don't even know what that is. Um, Mum looks great, though. Okay, no, just whoa, my brain. Mary absolutely oozed in her aptly chosen pussy suit. She had more curves than a dangerous stretch of highway. Her 
ass wouldn't just stop traffic. It would tell everyone to get out of their cars and jump in it instead. Whoa! Whoa. Mary. <laughs> it's pretty fine, though. you got to give it that. And they fashion a disguise for E.T. Good grief. Did they not realise he had work to do? He should be building a space radio, not parading around the neighbourhood in Mike spunk stained sheets. <laughs> So what was it with Milfy mums in the 80s? I movies? don't know. Because in Poltergeist, you know, she's got little hot pants and all that going on. Yeah, yeah. There was something stirring. <laughs> uh, this is kind of cool. Oh, also, I, I, um, E.T. is somehow able to construct some kind of communication device out of stuff on Earth. Not only stuff on Earth, but household items. On 80, 80s Earth. Yeah, dear Lord, that is <laughs> unbelievable, guys. That is stretching the limits of my imagination. E.T. Uh, unknowingly spied a kid in a Yoda mask. It looked a lot like his great uncle Dennis. Home, home, blurted E.T. to the embarrassment of everyone. <laughs> and then E.T. rides in Elliot's bicycle basket. And becomes the Amblin logo. <laughs> this was the truly the last straw, the ultimate humiliation riding bitch in the basket of a kid. Thank the stars his friends were three million light years away. It is kind of embarrassing when you think about it. He would find that kind of odd. I don't even know how he fits in it, considering he's about four feet high. It's and the basket's big, actually, yeah. about, you know, half a foot. He's supposed to be really heavy as well. Indeed. Uh, but another power. As Elliot near pissed himself, his bicycle triumphantly left the forest floor and flew recklessly into the air, silhouetted against the brilliant full moon. It formed a breathtaking image, the sort of thing you could put on a poster or a collector plate. Sure, the flying bike tricks of little purpose now, E.T. admitted, but it could prove, it prove useful later. I'm intrigued by that. Mm. And... In the forest, E.T. was setting up all sorts of shit that our primitive minds couldn't possibly understand. It's working, shroomed Elliot, not having the slightest idea what was working or not. You get that sometimes, that point where you think the novelizationist is just losing interest in the so. film, you know, and they just start sort of knocking it out on the page and trying to wrap up really quickly as if they've got better things to do. Mm -hmm. Kind of feel that a little bit here. Um, both Elliot and E.T. are getting sick in the Earth's atmosphere. E.T. is not looking well. He lay limp at the bottom of the reservoir, dry, white and hardened like one of Harvey's turds. Harvey's <laughs> the dog. E.T. groaned. This is what happened when your entire diet consisted of candy and beer and you hadn't been near a usable toilet for three days. Now, that's true. I've often wondered that. Where does E.T. E never shown going to the toilet? Yeah, I, I assume, like any other creature, he needs to make waste. Um, well, he does eat and drink. Well, reptiles don't need to eat or uh, excrete that often, so maybe he's sort, his system sort of set up like that. I don't know. He doesn't look well anyway, whatever's going on. And Mary is totally freaked out. Mom, uh, moaned the crusty white E.T., beckoning from the shower recess. Mary choked back a vomit. This was just like the time she'd walked in on her father in the shower. All right, something is happening here. This is just like you hear one story about Cosby and you think, oh, you know, maybe... <laughs> You hear a hundred stories about Cosby, you're like, something is wrong yeah. here. Yeah, this, yeah, he's, he doesn't like to lock the door, does he? At least he's very clean, we know that. <laughs> and then, the cold, faceless helmet of the astronaut marched into the living room, arms outstretched. He was gonna put a stop to this shit, this weird, senseless, unsettling alien bullshit. All those plastic tubes he'd bought were finally coming in handy. Well, that's good, at least. <laughs> Gonna get things done. And the government completely locked down the house, and they begin operating on the alien. Uh, I tried... Oh, yeah. uh, do you want me to do this one? It's a bit sweary. Okay. I tried, thought E.T. I did my best against the worst possible odds, and if I'm going to die like a whitened dog turd, then so be it. I worked with what I had, and it wasn't a lot. Fuck the human race. Fuck them. But God bless that speak and spell. <laughs> I had a speak and spell. No shit. I did not. So I, yeah, too young. It was pretty great. I never contacted anyone in space with it, but still, it's pretty good. All right, things look grim. You're killing him, screamed Elliot, tearing the electrodes from his skin. Just let it go, sighed E.T. We peaked 20 minutes ago. Now that's kind of meta. That seems like more of a comment on the film. Uh, yeah. Than what's happening in the scene. I think Howard Mason might have had the odd uh, sherry. 
So um, E.T. appears to die, all the lights are turned off, and everybody leaves. E.T. is put in a coffin kind of thing, like a refrigeration thing, and Elliot gets to say goodbye alone. And I'm not afraid to say that, even watching this again, I cried a bit. This is, this is pretty emotional. Elliot looked through the circular glass at the shrink-wrapped turd that was his old pal E.T. E.T. sobbed, E.T. sobbed Elliot, I love you, and he fucking meant it. Despite himself from within his icy tomb, E.T.'s heart glowed red with the heat of a thousand suns. He wasn't dead. He was just pretending for effect. E.T., phone home, he bellowed with reckless abandon. This was his battle cry. He was back, baby. Damn, son, thought Elliot. What a total baller move. They high-fived through the glass. I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. And E.T. lets all the neighbourhood kids fly into the air on their bikes. And this is the special edition, so... As the anti-alien forces grip their walkie-talkies with reckless, abandoned... Not guns. Four... T- f- I said 420. Uh, 420. <laughs> 420. Yeah, 420 children on pimped-out BMXs, took to the skies, uh, doing loop-the-loops and all sorts of other wicked tricks, uh, trying to appeal to the new, to the new generation. Thanks to E.T., the extraterrestrial's poorly defined powers... Uh, just go with it, urged E.T. mentally, the humili- <clears throat> humiliated within his basket. Thinking about this mistake... <laughs> nah, 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 I cannot talk. Cannot read, that's okay. Cannot read, yes. Oh, it's a very exciting book. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about this makes my head hurt. Oh, man, you said it. Yep. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> after a bike ride through the sky, E.T. and his family are reunited in the forest. And don't forget, this is the special edition, so... The ramp to the spherical spaceship slid open in a welcoming haze of welcoming mist. All of E.T.'s most treasured loved ones stood there, beckoning him, framed in the golden glow. His lovely wife, Hammerhead, his business partner, Chewbacca, what? his brother-in-law, Jar Jar Binks. Miss, I missed you, cooed Jar Jar, wiping a tear from his distended eye. They're all there. It's beautiful how they've just added them all in. And it, it's cross-promotion. Okay, I, I've got to admit, I didn't get to the end of this novelization. Are you, are you sure that's in there? I'm pretty sure, yeah. And here is the ending. E.T. and Elliot hugged. A begrudging hug, but they'd gotten there in the end. Mary winced, barely understanding what had just transpired between the alien and her son. And Gertie smirked, knowing that just by experiencing all of this, she had been fucked up for life. <laughs> Should I start experimenting with drugs, she wondered? <laughs> E.T. pressed an elongated finger against Elliot's nose. I'll be right here, he muttered in broken English, lying through his alien teeth. He had zero intention of taking up inhabitants within Elliot's nostril. E.T. retreated to his ship, determined to start drawing up plans for his wig business. However... Maybe we'll see each other again, called out Elliot. E.T. paused, turned around and winked one big blue eye. Maybe next time in Las Vegas, he chuckled. He slid the shades... Onto his face, and the ship ascended into the sky. Yeah, I remembered this reading it. Like, in 2002, they were talking about an E.T. E- sequel set in Las Vegas. Okay, like The Hangover? Yeah, it sounded so good, too. It's such a shame that they haven't made it. <laughs> I just think that would be fantastic. I don't know, Ghostbusters is happening, so... Look, maybe it's time to bring E.T. back. So that is the story of E.T. the Extraterrestrial. I love that, actually. So i got to ask you, was the book better? I think the book's definitely better and swearier and passive-aggressive. Yeah, but it's honest. That's what I like about it. Like, it really gets to the core of what that story's about. So I think it did a good job. I think um, Howard Mason is pretty awesome. And there's a couple of Amazon reviews as well. You'll have to uh, read some more of his novels. Yeah, for sure. My, that Baby Lost Legend sounds pretty good. This is such a moving adaptation of the film. It made me shit a kitten, E.T. for life. Whoa! That's pretty good. Life uh, with a Y. Yeah. I bought this book because I could not afford to see the movie. The movie came out over 30 years ago and I still can't afford to see it. I am terrible with money. Please help me. Uh, joking? I don't know. Maybe we can get some donations for that person. Uh Uh-huh. Surely we can get it to them. uh, Streaming, something like that. Mm. And finally, E.T. reminded me of that time I walked in on my grandfather in the shower. Just as wrinkly, but twice as exciting. E.T. rocks! (laughs) I guess, like, if you've ever walked in on your grandfather in the shower, then this is a book that is really easy to relate to. I guess. Because there's a lot of um, characters walking in on their grandfather in the shower. Yep. What about a spin-off book about him? Uh, No. No. 
Maybe in the sequel. And he when... finds a young boy, and the young boy keeps him in his uh, <laughs> wardrobe, and oh dear. <laughs> yeah, really fantastic. So there we go. Thank you so much, Courtney, for reading uh, this book, which is sort of reading. I, I'm the most, uh, I'm the te- worst at reading. No, life. you did a fantastic job. And look, the thing is, this is still just a really emotional story, and. Um, it's quite hard to read through it without getting a little bit sort of choked up and, and really thinking about the universal themes that, that come through that. So um, And cravings for Reese's Pieces. And, yeah, the creamy centre in the candy shell. So, um, look, thank you, everybody, for listening. Please listen to our other shows. They are, of course, FPCast, the Fruitless Pursuits podcast, uh, movie news and reviews every Monday, and Scar Joe a Go-Go every Thursday, where I watch every Scarlett Johansson film in chronological order. You can find out about all these shows at www.fruitlesspursuits.com. Please rate and review us. And um, I hope everybody has a, a really happy um, beginning of April tomorrow. Yes, April 1. April 1, enjoy that. Thanks again, and... Catch you on the lips. Jumanji. Jumanji.